It's time to dive back into the fact that Shakespeare's plays are mostly constructed out of verse, and here in this second episode of All Strut No Fret on Romeo and Juliet, we're going to go hunting for a particular kind of poem embedded in a very famous scene, and we're going to then uncover the secret of what that poem will tell us about what the actors are doing on stage at that moment. Told you this episode was about kissing. I'm going to keep coming back to the fact that the first thing you have to figure out when you look at any scene in Shakespeare is, am I looking at verse or at prose? Now, prose is just regular old writing. Verse is poetry. So let's look a bit closer at what varieties of that are available. In the Henry V videos, we looked at examples of blank verse. So that's verse where we have rhythm but no rhyme. But rhymed verse is completely available to these plays as well and turns up all the time. So that's more what you would recognise as poetry because it has rhyme as well as rhythm. But beyond simply having lines that rhyme, in order for you to recognise something as a poem, not just poetry, it needs to have a structure. And that structure is formed by things like the rhyme pattern, by the number of lines and so on. So now we're going to go look at one of the most popular forms of a poem available to writers in Shakespeare's day and ours. In Shakespeare's circle of colleagues and patrons, if you wanted to prove how cultivated and literate you were, you had to be able to knock out a sonnet. For the purposes of this conversation, it's useful to think of a sonnet as a poem that had 14 lines and different rhyme structures available could be thought of as a group of eight lines followed by a group of six or as three groups of four followed, um, finished off by a rhyming couplet. Shakespeare, of course, wrote a bunch of sonnets that were not embedded in plays, but writers of his time also would have looked to Italian poets like Petrarch for their idea of what a sonnet should be able to do. The sonnet was the form you used for love poetry, but it was also the tool you used to show off how good you were at being in love. What does this have to do with Romeo and Juliet? Well, Shakespeare was creating a romantic couple and he was putting them on an Elizabethan stage. In the scene where they meet, as in any romance, he needed to let the audience know that something important was going on. And the Elizabethans knew that a sonnet meant a particular kind of important. So how does this important meeting happen? What do they say to each other? What do they do? Well, Romeo spots Juliet across the room and he does what any brave young man would do and he goes up and grabs her hand, but then he has to speak. If I profane with my unworthiest hand this holy shrine, the gentler sin is this, my lips to blushing pilgrims ready stand to smooth that rough touch with a tender kiss. So Romeo grabs her hand, he kisses it, he's already talking in poetry, it's four lines in an A-B pattern. But so what? He might have that in his pocket, he might be bringing it to parties every weekend to impress the girls. What matters is what happens next because Juliet answers his four lines with four of her own, and those are in rhyming ABAB pattern too. So she's already shown that she is so quick on her feet because she couldn't have prepared this, that she can respond to his sally in kind. But after that, it gets even better because the next four lines are shared between the two of them. They are now already so in sync, so responsive to each other in the moment that they are able to create another four lines of rhyme. But while we do have verse here, we don't yet have a poem. We simply have stanza after stanza of that AB rhyme form. In order for this to become a sonnet, what it needs is 14 lines, which gives us space for a rhyming couplet at the end. But how are we going to get there? How are we going to meet that challenge? Because everybody knows that if the hero wants a reward, he has to complete a challenge. So what does Juliet do here? She throws down this one line, saints do not move, though grant for prayer's sake. And now she's left the field open for Romeo to succeed or to fail. 
Yes, he does it. He responds, then move not while my prayer's effect I take. He's completed the rhyming couplet at the end. That gives them three stanzas of four lines each plus a rhyming couplet, total of 14 lines. He's completed the sonnet. He gets the reward. And that's how we know at what point in this scene Romeo and Juliet kiss. This most literary of artefacts, the sonnet, is our means to know the answer to that most theatrical of questions, when do we get our romantic couple to snog? And that's why we care about what form the script is written in, because it gives us a way of leaping right ahead into understanding what the mechanics of a scene are and what emotional things are going on between characters and also what physical actions are being performed. It's amazing. I think most people accept that Romeo and Juliet has a lot of sex in it. How could it not? But I don't think most people realise how much of that is how is so explicit, uh, is occasionally dark, is perpetually linked with uh, with death or with violence or with uh, various forms of, of brutality or you know, certain characters are a carnal disgust, not just a carnal desire. And if you don't seek out those things, you're missing a very big portion of the play. I think part of the problem here is this amazing confusion of genre that this play presents because while everyone knows that it is a tragedy, they die at the end, no spoilers, it presents us with elements that look so much more familiar to comedy. We've got the uh, the girl who wants to marry, the obstacle in the way, the, uh, the bawdy humour, but close attention to the script shows the tragedy, the presence of death is always there. You're probably quite familiar with the opening prologue to this play, two households, both alike in dignity and so on, that tells us the full story. But I'm aware that there is a prologue to the beginning of Act 2 as well, and it centres entirely on a metaphor of love dying in order to, um, to create a new love out of the extinguishment of the old. That is there at the beginning of Act 2 to set the tone, so we can't say we weren't told what was going on. But have a look closely at this really famous line of Juliet's and look at the extraordinary cleverness of the dramatic irony here. When she sees Romeo, asks the nurse who he is, she says, Go ask his name. If he be married, my grave is like to be my wedding bed. Now, this is usually taken as a hyperbolic expression of Juliet's feeling that if he's not available, if he's already married, she'll die of not getting him. But look at the perfection of the trick that when he marries, he does, in fact, make her wedding bed her grave. And you're going to find echoes of this all throughout the play. Every time Romeo walks in, either in person or in reference from other people, he's spoken of as if he is carrying death with him, as if he himself can be identified with death. I'm not pushing a line that Romeo is a villain or consciously malicious or even that he's cursed in any straightforward way. I am suggesting that Romeo as a figure of death walking through the comic structures that scaffold this play and turning it into what it ultimately must become is a powerful image and a lesson in looking closely at the details of this play rather than assuming we know it. I know it looks as if my five crucial steps have completely fallen by the wayside, but I'm hoping in the next video when we return to the importance of reading the last word of each line and I begin to go through the activities for marking up the scansion, you'll see the way all this ties in together and shows us where to look. In the meantime, the lessons to take away are look for the form, give plenty of time to paying attention to the details, be open to finding things that you never suspected were there. Never forget for a moment the way all these elements interact and support one another. And 
Always travel with a sonnet in your pocket.